Help support Name Explain by liking this video, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. The word water unto itself is incredibly ancient, which is no surprise considering how incredibly important this stuff is for life on this planet. Water would have been talked about when a language was first created. The word wouldn't have just sprung up a few years back with some neat etymology to go with it. It comes from the Proto-Indo-European Wodwo, meaning water. And from here, the word traveled through languages, becoming the Gothic Wato, the Norse Vathna, the German Wasser, and the English Water. In Latin, however, water was aqua, and while we didn't use that word specifically as a name for water in English, we use it and variations of it when talking about things relating to water, like how animals that live in water are aquatic. It does explain to us how where the Italian and Spanish words for water, aqua and agua respectively, came from. You don't really need me to tell you there's a lot of water on the planet. Just look at any map or globe and you'll see that for yourself. Around 70% of the earth is covered in water, and the total amount of water on the planet comes to an estimated 326 million trillion gallons. Though there isn't just a massive clump of water all in one place on our planet, water is present in so many ways across Earth, from huge, seemingly never-ending expanses to teeny tiny amounts found in the strangest places. It can be calm and still, all collected in one place, and it can be free-flowing and always on the move. Water can appear in places thanks to nature, or water can be directed to locations by humans. There's so many ways water can be seen. All these different ways that water accumulates are called bodies of water, and different kinds of bodies of water have different names. All these different names for bodies of water, however, can seem to be a little confusing and even overlap at times. Like a lake and a pond seem pretty similar, so why do they have different names and what differences are there between the two to justify the different names? Same for a river and a stream, and an ocean and a sea, and what on earth is a channel exactly, or an estuary, or an oxbow lake? These are all names for bodies of water you may have heard of but have no clue what they actually are. Well, in this video I hope to explain what exactly all these different names for different bodies of water actually mean, and uncover what differences there are between these types of water bodies to allow for so many names to exist, and of course find out where these names came from in the first place. Hopefully after this video, things will be a little bit more clear to you in the world of aquatic nomenclature, and you'll be able to tell your straits from your sounds, and your brooks from your bays. Also, quick side note slash plug, if you want to know how specific bodies of water got their names, then by gosh, do we have the videos for you. We have videos about how the oceans got their names, how the seas got their names, countries that are named after rivers, lakes with weird names, and even our recent geographical features video covered some names for bodies of water that we won't touch upon here. Hopefully, if I remembered by the time you're watching this, I would have compiled these videos into a water playlist you can watch for yourself by clicking the button in the corner. But why not watch this video first? As I mentioned, we have covered oceans already, but we need to go over them again here as they are the biggest bodies of water that we have on our planet. They're huge saltwater bodies of water that make up the majority of planet Earth. It's thought that around 97% of the world's water supplies comes from oceans. If you need an example of an ocean, how about the Atlantic Ocean that separates Europe and Africa from the Americas? The name ocean itself is thought to derive from the Greek Okinos, which in Greek mythology was the name for the huge river that wrapped around the Earth's disk. The names of ocean and sea are used by some interchangeably, however there is a difference between the two. Seas are smaller parts of oceans that tend to be enclosed by land. This may sound a bit confusing, but see how the Mediterranean Sea is enclosed by Europe, Asia and Africa. This is a pretty big example of a sea though. In fact, the Mediterranean is such a big sea, other seas come off of it, like the Adriatic Sea between Italy and Croatia. When you see other seas, you will notice this trend that they are all enclosed by land. Sea is an old word, coming from the Proto-Germanic Saiwa. Kind of like a sea is a channel. Now there seems to be two defining features of a channel. One feature is that they are nestled quite snugly between two land masses, and the other being that they connect two larger bodies of water. And a great example of this is at the English Channel, which I live literally a minute away from, not to brag. The English Channel is snugly between the UK and France, and connects the two larger bodies of water, the Celtic Sea and the North Sea together. So yes, it's a prime example of a channel. Channel comes from the old French channel, meaning waterway slash tube slash gutter and derives from the Latin canalis, which also gave us the name for another body of water we will talk about later. When I was searching for what exactly a channel is, I saw it being described as a strait, which I thought was a different body of water entirely. However, it does seem that there are some similarities between the two, and the two terms can be somewhat interchangeable. I did say a lot of these are confusing and overlap. Like a channel, a strait is a narrow body of water that connects two larger bodies of water. In fact, it seems that 
straight and narrower than channels on the whole. I mean, look at how narrow the Strait of Gibraltar gets. And it also connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean. The name comes from the old French estrelat, meaning narrow pass. Next up, we have a gulf, which I read a variety of definitions for. One being that they are part of an ocean that's overtaken some land, and the other being that gulfs are large areas of a sea that are almost entirely surrounded by land with an opening. The famous Gulf of Mexico seems to be more the latter, as it comes from the Caribbean Sea, and it has an opening between the US state of Florida and the Mexican state of Quintana Roo. This is a massive gulf, but they very much can vary in size. Gulf has an interesting etymology. It's from the Italian golfo, which is from the late Latin colophos, which is from the Greek kolopos. This Greek word originally meant bosom, but then transitioned to mean curved shaped, which is fitting as both gulfs and bosoms tend to be curved shaped. It seems that a bay and a gulf are very similar. However, a bay is less enclosed than a gulf and has a wider opening. The Bay of Bengal is a great example of this. I was going to use the Bay of Biscay as an example here, but despite the name, it's apparently a gulf. As I've said, this is all rather confusing and silly. Bay as a word has a lot of meanings, but its meaning comes from the late Latin baia and means the same thing. And we also have coves which are like bays and gulfs, but on a much smaller level. Tiny areas of sea more or less surrounded by land. The scenic Porth Kerno Cove in Cornwall is a prime example. Cove comes from Old English and means a cave slash nook. The final one I want to talk about which is similar to a gulf slash bay slash cove is a sound. I have read them defined as an area of sea water by the coast that can take two forms, where they're either surrounded by hills and mountains due to being pushed there by river water, or they're littered with small islands. Wikipedia even states that there is little consistency in the use of sound in English language place names, so why am I even bothering with this one if the English language can't even be bothered? I would share a good example of a sound, but because there's so much inconsistency in what a sound is, I do think there really is one definitive sound that sets a good example. Here's the pretty Plymouth sound nevertheless though. The name has nothing to do with actual sound. It comes from the old Norse sund, meaning a strait slash swimming. There's also bites and fjords that get mixed up with sounds and gulfs and bays and coves too, but we've talked more than enough about salt water. Let's move on to some fresher waters with rivers. Rivers are winding bodies of water that cut through land masses. The water in them does not stand still, but flows downstream thanks to gravity. All rivers eventually flow back into the oceans, sometimes via the sea or other bodies of water though. I am sure you can think of a river for yourself, but the Amazon River is the one that comes to mind for me as a huge example. River is an old word coming from the Latin lipalius, meaning of the river bank. Similar to a river is a stream. It would be easy to get these confused or mixed up. It seems the main difference between the two is that streams are much smaller. Stream comes from the proto in the European root slur, meaning to flow. You may have heard of creeks too, and from what I could tell, this is a regional term for streams used in nations like the USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. A tributary is a kind of stream, specifically a small stream that flows into a larger stream, or even a river. Many big rivers have tributaries such as the ones of the Nile. The name comes from tribute, as these smaller streams are seen as tributes to the larger river they flow into. When a river finally meets up with the ocean slash sea, the fresh water and the salt water mix, and this part of the river has a name unto itself. They are called estuaries, and yes, once again, these estuaries can be seen as bays. New York City is actually built on an estuary. As estuaries are a mix of sea and fresh water, they can get rather marshy, hence why the name comes from the Latin estalia meaning tidal marsh. Another name for where a river empties their water into another body of water is a delta. In fact, the general wetlands around there are called deltas too. Deltas are usually defined by the many smaller streams that rivers break into as they enter the sea, and the land around them becoming islands. They look quite satisfying from a bird's eye perspective, especially this one in Kashamak Bay in Alaska. It's because of this shape as to why they have the name delta. Delta is also the name of the fourth letter in the Greek alphabet, and it is shaped like a triangle. These parts of the rivers were also seen to be shaped like triangles, so the name of the letter was applied to them. And finally, in the world of rivers and streams, I want to talk about brooks, which are very small streams, most defined by how shallow they are. It derives from the Proto-Germanic brocke, meaning marsh slash bog. Though I read that in certain English dialects, it means water meadow. 
Next up we have lakes, which are simply defined as a body of water surrounded by land. They can vary greatly in size, from pretty small things to huge things like Lake Superior. They are also freshwater too, hence why things like the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea are considered inland seas, as they have somewhat salty water. Though many also class them as huge lakes, it's confusing. Lake comes from the Latin word for them, lacus. It would be good to mention locks here too, which is a regional dialect term for lakes, but is also applied to other bodies of water water too. Loch tends to be seen most in Scotland and Ireland, with Loch Ness in example. A specific, very interesting kind of lake is an oxbow lake. These form when a bend of a river becomes disconnected and forms a separate body of water. Carter Lake in the USA is a city built around an oxbow lake. Originally an oxbow was exactly that, something of a bow for oxen. They were put on oxen so they could pull carts and such. The similar shape led to these former river bends being called Oxbow Lakes. In Australia, however, Oxbow Lakes go by another name you may have heard of, Billabongs. Ponds are like lakes, but usually much smaller, and they can be artificially made too. Ponds can be found anywhere from in the wild, to parks, to back gardens, often littered with ducks and koi. The word pond comes from pound, as it is an enclosed place like a dog pound, nothing to do with the weight or currency. This is because, like a dog pound, ponds are enclosed too, so they are like a pound, but for fish instead of dogs. While ponds are sometimes artificially made, it seems like canals are exclusively man-made. Canals are made by humans to help with navigation and transportation. Many cities are known for their canals, like the romantic cities of Venice, Amsterdam, and Birmingham. As I mentioned all the way back with the channels coming from Latin canalis, so does the word canal, and that Latin word means water pipe slash groove. A really cool man-made body of water is a moat. Moats are deep, water-filled pits built around castles and other forts. Their purpose was defense, as it would help make sure no unwanted visitors could get in. In example, the Forbidden City in China has a great moat. They are often depicted as being crocodile-filled, though it seems that actually wasn't ever really the case. The word comes from the old French moat meaning mound slash embankment, as many castles with moats were built on mounds. I adore the fact that on Wikipedia's list of bodies of water, puddles are one of them. As I said at the start, water bodies can come in all different sizes, from the mighty oceans to the humble puddles. I am sure you know what a puddle is. They are bodies of water formed in dips in the ground via rain, and while I may be downplaying puddles, they can actually get pretty big and dangerous, especially in roads. Puddle comes from the old English pud, meaning ditch, as many puddles form in ditches. And finally, I want to end on perhaps the most unique and smallest bodies of water you will come across, that being Phytotelma. This is the tiny body of water that forms within the cavity of a plant, whether that be in the hollow of a tree or within the flower slash stem of a plant. They might seem silly, but they can actually be important for wildlife. Some amphibians and aquatic insects call them home. The name is just as cute, coming from the Greek word phyoton meaning plant and telema meaning pond, so the name fittingly means plant pond. So hopefully now you should be much more understanding on what name applies to what body of water and what differences there are to allow for all of these fun names. Now however, I want you to put the newfound knowledge you achieve from this video to the test. Here are three different bodies of water from around the world. I want you to tell me what kind of bodies of water they are. The answers will be in the pinned comment of this video. Just the seas and straits were suggested by Shayashan, and thanks to their suggestion, they will now be honoured as name explains patron saint of seas and straits. Do you have a good idea for somewhere that's name could be covered in a name explained video? If so, then please consider donating on Patreon. Just one dollar a month helps keep the channel running and earns you a weekly chance to suggest somewhere to be turned into a video, and you too could be a name explain Patreon saint. Thank you to all my patrons who support Name Explain on a monthly basis. Name Explain depends on small monthly donations from fans like you to help keep the channel running. Just a small amount of $2 a month helps in a huge way, grants you patron exclusive Name Explain extras, and gets your name here with all these awesome people. Thank you. Hello all and thank you so much for reaching the end of the video. Check out another video and subscribe to stay in the loop on all things Name Explain. You can follow myself on Twitter at NameExplainYT. Follow me there and tweet the name Jerry at me so I know you came from this message. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and once again, thank you all so much.